In the context of clinical practice, you may have learned that lymphadenopathy is a significant clinical finding associated with acute infection, autoimmune disease and malignancy. The involvement of specific lymph nodes groups is an indicator of pathologically affected organs and tissues, and if you're a medical student, dentistry or allied health student, you will have developed an approach to the assessment of the nodal groups in your physical examination sessions. Welcome back to another Lightboard video that aims to break down complex concepts in a simple manner. My name is Dr. Nikki and today I'll be summarizing the anatomical arrangement of the major nodal groups of the head and neck using a drawing to learning approach. I will also be discussing the lymphatic drainage patterns which are critical to understanding the spread of infection and malignant disease. So the lymphatic vessels of the head and neck can be divided into two main groups, superficial vessels and deep vessels. The superficial vessels tend to form a ring-like structure or chain around the head, and these are referred to as the pericervical column. These can also be called and appear as a horizontal chain of nodes. The deep vessels, on the other hand, represent vertical chains and are in close proximity to the internal jugular vein. Starting with the head, our lymphatic fluid from the muscles, the tissues and glands will drain primarily to five main groups of superficial lymph nodes. So starting posteriorly at the base of the skull, we have the occipital lymph node group. The occipital lymph nodes are located on the superior nuchal line or crest, specifically between the attachments of the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscle. The afferent drainage of the occipital lymph nodes are going to be the occipital region, so the back of the head or the back of the scalp, as well as the superior neck. The next lymph node group located anterior to the occipital nodes is going to be our retroauricular, or also called the mastoid lymph nodes. There are approximately one to three of these mastoid lymph nodes, and these can be found at the insertion of the sternocleidomastoid muscle at the mastoid process of the skull. These nodes are going to receive lymph from the posterior half of the lateral face, the adjacent region of the scalp, as well as the posterior ear will drain to this group. Moving then anterior to the ear or the auricle, we have the parotid lymph nodes. The parotid lymph nodes can also be referred to as the preauricular lymph node group, and some textbooks you will find tend to separate these into an anterior or preauricular group and a superficial parotid lymph node group. But for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to group them as one. As a group, the parotid lymph nodes can be found superficial to the parotid salivary gland, and these are going to drain the anterior half of the face, the deep temporal regions, as well as the middle ear. The final two groups of the pericervical collar are the submental and submandibular lymph nodes. Starting off with the submental nodes, these are going to be found just inferior to the chin in the submental fascial space, and these are also located in the midline inferior to the mandibular symphysis in the suprahyoid region. Their afferent drainage, so the lymph draining toward the submental lymph node, is going to come from the lower lip, both sides of the chin, the floor of the mouth, the tip of the tongue, as well as the lower incisors. The submental lymph nodes will then drain to the submandibular nodes, in which we have three to six in number, and these are found at the inferior or lower border of the ramus of the mandible, superficial to the submandibular salivary gland. 
The submandibular lymph nodes will receive lymph from the cheeks, the upper lips, the body of the tongue, and all of the teeth except for the lower incisors and the third molars. We also then, located in the face, have the facial lymph nodes, which I'm not going to draw on this diagram. The facial lymph nodes too, similar to the submental lymph nodes, will eventually drain back to the submandibular nodes. All of these groups of our pericervical nodes will then drain into the deep cervical lymph nodes, and we will cover these in a second. Ferenbuck and Herring's textbook also lists two additional superficial lymph node groups in relation to the external jugular vein. These are the external jugular nodes and the anterior jugular lymph nodes. The external jugular nodes can be palpated along the external jugular vein, just superficial to and posterior to the sternocleidomastoid. These nodes may be secondary nodes for the occipital, mastoid and parotid lymph nodes, meaning that these specific nodal groups may drain here first before then coursing to the deep nodes. These nodes specifically will also drain the superficial, lateral as well as the posterior triangles of the neck. In some textbooks, such as Gray's Anatomy, these are called your superior jugular nodes. The anterior jugular lymph nodes, on the other hand, drain the superficial anterior cervical triangle, and these can be found just in front of the larynx and trachea, as well as in front of the sternocleidomastoid, along the anterior jugular vein. We now reach our deep cervical nodes. So notice that I've drawn all of our superficial nodes in the color pink. I'm going to try and use yellow then for our deep nodes. We have approximately 15 to 30 lymph nodes in number in this group, and these are located generally along the course of the internal jugular vein. These are also arranged in a vertical manner. So the first vertical chain of nodes deep to the sternocleidomastoid is going to be our superior deep cervical nodes. We also then have our inferior deep cervical nodes. As I've mentioned, the afferent drainage to the superior deep cervical node is going to come from our submandibular lymph nodes, our parotid and our mastoid nodes. We also have then contributions from the external jugular lymph nodes back into that superior deep cervical group. The superior deep cervical group is separated from the inferior group with reference to the crossing of the omohyoid muscle over the internal jugular vein. So the nodes above this level are going to be our superior group and the nodes below are going to then be the inferior group. There is one specific node within the superior deep cervical group that can be palpated when enlarged, and especially when the palatine tonsils undergo lymphadenopathy. These are going to be the jugulodigastric lymph node. In addition, there is one more group that is going to drain directly into the superior group, and these are going to be the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. These lymph nodes are going to be considered deep and drain posterior to, as well as, the pharynx, the palate, the paranasal sinuses, as well as the nasal cavity. The inferior deep cervical lymph nodes are then going to be a continuation of the superior group located just below this omohyoid muscle. The Gray's Anatomy textbook refers to this as the mid jugular lymph node group. A possibly prominent node in this group is going to be the jugular omohyoid node, which is going to drain lymph from the tongue as well as the submental regions.
The inferior deep cervical nodes will also receive their afferent lymph drainage from the anterior jugular lymph nodes, as well as the prelaryngeal and the pretracheal lymph nodes, which we'll cover when we learn about the thorax. The efferent drainage of the inferior deep cervical nodes is going to be to the jugular trunks, which are going to be a confluence with the subclavian and bronchomediastinal trunks to then drain to the major ducts, being the thoracic duct and the right lymphatic duct. Remember that all of the lymph from the left half of the head and upper limb drain to the thoracic duct and then all of the right side drain to the right lymphatic duct. Finally, located posteriorly to this vertical chain that we have just discussed, we then find a posterior chain that is referred to as the accessory lymph nodes, also referred to as the spinal accessory or the posterior lateral cervical lymph nodes. The accessory lymph nodes will receive their afferent drainage specifically from the occipital nodes, as well as areas of the neck. These drain directly into another group of nodes that are called the supraclavicular lymph nodes. We have approximately 1 to 10, these are going to be variable, but they are located along the length of the clavicle, so posterior to the origin of the sternocleidomastoid and within the supraclavicular fossa. These nodes can empty either into the jugular trunk or they might enter directly into the thoracic duct or the right lymphatic duct. This group is going to represent the end point for lymphatic drainage from the entire body, with lymph from the gastrointestinal tract, the genito, urinary and pulmonary structures, all passing through these nodes first, before then draining into the two major ducts. Of clinical significance, the supraclavicular node located on the left side of the body can also be called Furco's node. The clinical finding of a hard and enlarged FERCO node may be associated with a high risk of abdominal malignancy. This can also be called Troisier's sign. A painless but palpable FERCO node is suggestive of cancer, and the differentials include prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, breast, pancreatic, or lymphoma, as examples. While a painful node, on the other hand, is more suggestive of infection. So I tend to remember cancer is painless, while infection is painful when examining the FERCO node. So the drawing that I've provided you with is a representation of the lymph node groups and common drainage patterns, which really is a bit of a mashup between the Ferrin, Buck and Herring, as well as the Gray's Anatomy textbooks, also implementing some of the Radiopedia information, as well as my own teaching by my own undergraduate lectures when I was at university. As an educator, I personally found that every single resource and textbook that I consulted on this particular topic used different names to name the lymph node groups and presented different drainage patterns. So I hope that bringing a variety of sources together has provided or presented you with a consensus through this one video to help you learn such a complex area and topic. For more such lymphatic drainage and lymph node videos, please make sure that you subscribe to my YouTube channel or please reach out directly for any content requests. Thank you very much for your attention.